Emanuela Orlandi, born the 14th of January 1968, Vatican City, disappeared the 22nd of June 1983. Emanuela Orlandi was a subject of Vatican City who mysteriously disappeared on the 22nd of June. Nineteen sightings of Orlandi in various places have been reported over the years, including inside Vatican City, but all have been unreliable. Emanuela was the fourth of five children of Urkel and Maria Orlandi. Her father was an employee of the Vatican Bank according to some reports or an employee of the papal household according to others. In any event, the family lived inside Vatican City and the children had the free run of the Vatican Gardens. According to Pietro Orlandi, Emanuela's older brother Orlandi was in her second year at Elysio Scientifico in Rome. Although the school year had concluded, she continued to take flute lessons three times per week at the Tommaso Ludovico da Victoria School connected with the Pontifical Institute of Sacred Music. She was also part of the choir of the Church of Santana de Palafrenery in the Vatican. Orlandi usually traveled by bus to the music school. She would get off the bus after a few stops and then walk 180 to 210 meters. On Wednesday, the 22nd of June 1983, Orlandi was late to class. She had asked Pietro to ride on the bus to the class but he had other commitments. I've gone over it so many times, telling myself if only I had accompanied her maybe it wouldn't have happened, he recalled decades later. Later that day, Emanuela called home, speaking to one of her sisters. Since then, there has been no trace of the teenager, and Italian investigators have been unable to reach a conclusion about what happened to her. She had explained her tardiness in a telephone conversation with her sister, stating that she said she had received a job offer from a representative of Avon Cosmetics. Her sister suggested she talk it over with their parents before making any decisions. According to some reports, Orlandi allegedly met with the Avon rep shortly before her music lesson. At the end of the lesson, Orlandi spoke of the job offer with a girlfriend, who then left the girl at a bus stop in the company of another girl. Orlandi was allegedly last seen getting into a large, dark-colored BMW. At 15.00 hours on Thursday the 23rd of June, Orlandi's parents called the director of the music school to ask if any of their daughter's classmates had information. The police had suggested waiting because perhaps the girl was with friends. She was officially declared a missing person that day. Over the next two days, announcements of the disappearance were published with the telephone number of the Orlandi house in the newspapers Il Tempo, Peace Sira and Il Messagero. At 18 on Saturday, the 25th of June, a phone call was received from a youth who claimed to be a 16-year-old boy named Pirliwick. He reported that he and his fiancé had met the missing girl in Piazza Navona that afternoon. A young man mentioned Orlandi's flute, her hair, and the glasses that the girl did not like to wear, along with other details that fit the missing girl. According to Pirliwick, Orlandi had just had a haircut and had introduced herself as Barbarella. He claimed she stated that she had just run away from home and was selling Avon products. On the 28th of June, a man calling himself Mario called the family and claimed to own a bar near Pont Vittorio. Between the Vatican and the music school, the man said that a girl called Barbara, a new customer, had confided to him about being a fugitive from home but said that she would return home for her sister's wedding. On the 30th of June, Rome was plastered with 3,000 posters displaying Orlandi's photograph. On Sunday the 3rd of July, Pope John Paul II, during the Angelus, appealed to those responsible for Orlandi's disappearance, making the hypothesis of kidnapping official for the first time. Two days later, the Orlandi family received the first of a number of anonymous phone calls. Emanuela was supposedly the prisoner of a terrorist group demanding the release of Mehmet Ali Akka, the Turkish man who shot the Pope in May 1981. No other information was given. In the following days, other calls were received, including one from a man identified as the American, due to his apparent accent, who played a recording of Orlandi's voice over the phone. A few hours later, in another phone call to the Vatican, the same man suggested an exchange of Orlandi for Agka. The anonymous interlocutor mentioned the Mario and Pirliwiki of the earlier telephone calls, defining them as members of the organization. On the 6th of July, 
A man with a young voice and an American accent informed the ANSA news agency of the demand for an Orlandi Agca exchange, asking for the Pope's participation within 20 days and indicating that a basket in the public square near the parliament would contain proof that Orlandi was indeed in his hands. These were to have been photocopies of her music school ID, a receipt, and a note handwritten by the kidnapped girl. However, the magistrate who was overseeing Orlandi's case did not believe that there was a credible connection between Orlandi's abduction and the Pope's assailant. On the 8th of July, a man with an alleged Middle Eastern accent phoned one of Orlandi's classmates saying Orlandi was in his hands and that they had 20 days to make the exchange with Agka. The man also asked for a direct telephone line with then-Secretary of State Agostino Casaroli. The line was installed on the 18th of July. A total of 16 telephone calls were made by the American from different public telephone booths. On the morning of the 14th of May 2001, the parish priest of the Gregory Seven Church near the Vatican discovered a human skull of small dimensions and lacking a jaw in a bag with an image of Padre Pio in a confessional. It has not been officially identified as Orlandi's skull. Emanuela's father, Urkel, died in 2004, a month after giving his last interview. Over the years a number of theories regarding the motives for the crime have been broached in the Italian press. Orlandi Agca Connection Theory Agca, who once declared that Orlandi had been kidnapped by Bulgarian agents of the Grey Wolves, a Turkish ultra-nationalist, neo-fascist youth organization of which Agca was a member, spoke about Orlandi during a prison interview with Italy's Rai State Television, telling the interviewer that the girl was alive, not in danger and living in a cloistered convent. He denied any direct knowledge of the girl's fate, though, saying that he had made some logical deductions. With no evidence to support these claims, the case was closed in July 1997. In mid-2000, Judge Ferdinando Impossimato, based on what he had learned about the Grey Wolves, declared that Orlandi, by then an adult, was living a perfectly integrated life in the Muslim community and that she had probably lived for a long time in Paris. He remains the only supporter of this idea and of the Orlandi Agca connection. In a letter published in 2006, Agca claimed that Emanuela Orlandi and another girl, Myrla Grigori, both of whom vanished in 1983, were abducted as part of a plan to secure his release from prison. He claimed that the girls were whisked away to a royal palace in Liechtenstein. Agka was temporarily released from an Istanbul prison after serving 25 years in Italy and Turkey for the murder of Abdi Ayksay, a prominent Turkish journalist. However, he was quickly imprisoned again, the release seemingly a mistake. Agka was permanently released from a Turkish prison in January 2010. On the 9th of November 2010, Agka was interviewed by state television in Turkey TRT's Cosmic Oda program for the first time since his release the preceding January. In that interview, as well as declaring that the Vatican organized the assassination attempt, he claimed that Orlandi was kept as a prisoner by the Vatican and was then living in a Central European country as a nun in a Catholic monastery. He added that Orlandi's family could see their daughter whenever they liked, but that she was not allowed to leave the monastery. In 2011, the former Banda della Magliana member Antonio Mancini implied that Orlandi's kidnapping was one of a number of strikes that the gang was making against the Vatican in order to force the restitution of large amounts of money it had lent to the Vatican Bank through Roberto Calvi's Banco Ambrosiano. On the 14th of May 2012, Italian police opened the tomb of gangster Enrico de Pettis and took DNA samples, according to some reports at that time. An anonymous call to an Italian television program in 2005 said it contained evidence that would help the police explain Orlandi's disappearance. And in 2008 a former girlfriend of De Petty's said that De Petty's had once confessed to her that he had kidnapped Orlandi. No clues were found in the tomb linking De Petty's to Emanuela. In May 2012, when interest in the case was renewed, leading police to search the De Petty's tomb. Then 85-year-old exorcist father Gabriel Morth claimed that Orlandi was kidnapped by a member of the Vatican police for sex party and then murdered. Morth claimed that officials of an unnamed foreign embassy were involved as well. On the 6th of April 2007, in a Good Friday sermon in St. Peter's Basilica, 
Rev. Rainiero Cantalamus advised the congregation to make amends for sins before dying. He said, Don't carry your secret to the grave with you. This provoked speculation that he was suggesting someone at the Vatican held information about Orlandi's disappearance. Vatican spokesperson Rev. Federico Lombardi issued a statement that detailed Vatican cooperation with civil investigators over the years and said the church had no objection to the opening of the De Petty's tomb, which was then being discussed. It said, As far as we know, there is nothing hidden, nor are there secrets in the Vatican to reveal on the subject. To continue to assert it is completely unjustified. Also, we reiterate, yet again, all the material from the Vatican was handed over, in its time, to the investigating magistrates and to police authorities. In October 2018, remains found during renovation work on the Holy See's embassy to Italy and Rome were the subject of speculation related to the Orlandi affair. An attorney for the Orlandi family objected to the media attention. She said, we have no idea why the association with Emanuela was made. We're still asking ourselves why you'd find some bones and immediately assume they were Emanuela's. Test results released on the 1st of February 2019 showed they were the remains of a Roman man who died between 190 and 238. D. On the 10th of July 2019, it was announced that the Vatican would be opening two tombs inside Vatican City which would then be examined by forensic anthropologist Giovanni Arcuti. The tombs were the tomb of the angel meant to contain the remains of Princess Sophie of Hohenloch Waldenburg Bartenstein and the adjacent one which was meant to contain the remains of Duchess Charlotte Frederica of Mecklenburg Schwerin. The exhumations took place on the 11th of July 2019. Neither Emanuela's body nor the bodies of the two princesses said to be buried there were found. The Vatican Susan Powell Susan Marie Powell is an American missing person from West Valley City, Utah, whose disappearance and presumed murder, as well as the subsequent investigation and events, garnered national media attention. Susan's husband Joshua was named a person of interest in the investigation into her disappearance but was never charged. On February 5, 2012, Joshua killed himself and their two young sons, Charles Joshua Powell and Brad and Timothy Powell in a murder-suicide after custody of the boys had been awarded to Susan's parents, Judy and Charles Cox, on May 21, 2013. West Valley City Police closed their active investigation into Susan's disappearance, stating that they believed Joshua murdered her and that his brother, Michael, who also killed himself in February 2013 after suspicion grew around him had assisted him in concealing her body. Since then, there have been repeated attempts to have Susan legally declared dead. Joshua Powell was born on January 20, 1976, to Stephen and Terika Powell in Pileup, Washington. Joshua's parents had a dysfunctional marriage, caused in large part by Stephen's disaffection with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, according to divorce filings by Terika in 1992. Stephen shared pornography with Joshua and his two brothers and refused to teach or enforce limits on certain behaviors. As a teenager, Joshua allegedly killed gerbils belonging to one of his sisters and threatened his mother with a butcher knife. He also attempted suicide on at least one occasion. By 1998, Joshua was living in Seattle as a student at the University of Washington. It was here that he began a relationship with a young woman named Catherine Terry Everett whom he met at a local LDS church congregation. After the two moved into an apartment together, Joshua became possessive towards Everett. He would have restrictions and limitations on what I could and couldn't do when it came to my family. She later recalled, if I was going to go visit them, he had to come too. I couldn't go by myself. Whenever it visited a friend in Utah without Joshua, she decided not to return to Seattle and broke up with him over the phone. Joshua met Susan Cox a classmate at his LDS Church Institute of Religion course. During a dinner party at his Tacoma apartment in November 2000, the two began a relationship and married in the Portland, Oregon Temple in April 2001. Joshua had a bachelor's degree in business and worked for a number of different companies over the years. While Susan, a trained cosmetologist, took up a job with Wells Fargo Investments after the family's relocation to West Valley City. Utah, a suburb of Salt Lake City, the Powells went on to have two sons, Charles, 
born in 2005, and Braden, born in 2007. For a brief period following their wedding, Joshua and Susan lived at Stephen Powell's home in South Hill, Washington. Initially unbeknownst to Susan, her father-in-law Stephen had developed an obsessive infatuation with her which was only inflamed by their close proximity. Stephen followed Susan around the house with a camcorder, used a small mirror to spy on her while she used the bathroom, stole her underwear from her laundry, read her journals, and even posted love songs online under a pseudonym. In 2003, Stephen confessed his amorous feelings to a stunned Susan, who rejected him. The encounter was inadvertently captured by Stephen's camcorder microphone. The Powells moved out of state soon after, partly so Susan could distance herself from Stephen. Susan's journal entries and email correspondence indicated the presence of marital discord. There was tension with Joshua over his refusal to attend church services with his family and over his continued contact with Stephen despite his father's ongoing advances towards Susan. Susan's friends also pointed to Joshua's extremely controlling behavior towards his wife and to his extravagant spending habits. Joshua filed for bankruptcy in 2007 declaring over $200,000 in debts. Susan recorded a video in July 2008 surveying property damage she attributed to Joshua and wrote a secret will that included the statements, I want it documented that there is extreme turmoil in our marriage and, if I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. On the morning of December 6, 2009, Susan, Charles and Braddon attended church services. A neighbor visited them at home in the afternoon. Leaving at about 5 p.m., this was the last time Susan was seen by someone from outside the Powell household. At first, the entire Powell family was reported missing on December 7 by relatives. Joshua's mother, Terika, and sister, Jennifer Graves, went looking for the family at their house shortly after being informed that the children had not been dropped off at daycare that morning. They called the police when they failed to make contact with Joshua and Susan. The police broke into the house, fearing that the family were victims of carbon monoxide poisoning. They found no one inside, but noticed two box fans blowing at a wet spot on the couch. Susan did not show up at her job on December 7th. Her purse, wallet, and identification were all found at the house. Her cell phone was later found in the family's only vehicle, a Chrysler town and country minivan that Joshua had been using. Later that day, at about 5 p.m., Joshua returned home with the two boys and was taken to the police station for questioning. He claimed he had left Susan sleeping at home shortly after midnight on December 7, and had taken his boys on a camping trip to Simpson Springs in western Utah. Police visited Simpson Springs on December 10, but found no evidence of the campsite that Joshua had described. They also found it suspicious that Joshua would take his young boys out camping in blizzard conditions after midnight when he was scheduled to go to work at his job just hours later. Joshua had not told his boss that he would not be coming into work that day, and explained to police it was because he had thought it was Sunday rather than Monday. Upon searching the Powell residence on December 9th, investigators found traces of Susan's blood on the floor. Life insurance policies on Susan for you sown $0.5 million, and a handwritten letter from Susan expressing fear for her life. DNA test results, released in 2013, matched one blood sample with Susan, while another sample was determined to have come from an unknown male contributor. In August 2012, West Valley City Police released documents showing that Joshua took actions that were regarded as highly suspicious following Susan's disappearance. Joshua liquidated Susan's retirement accounts, canceled her regularly scheduled chiropractic sessions, and withdrew his children from daycare. He had also previously spoken to co-workers about how to hide a body in an abandoned mine shaft in the western Utah desert. Police interviewed the couple's elder son, Charlie who confirmed that the camping trip Joshua described took place. However, unlike his father, he stated that Susan had gone with them and she did not return, weeks after her disappearance. A teacher reported that Charlie had claimed that his mother was dead. Furthermore, Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox, claimed that while at daycare several months after the disappearance, Braddon drew a picture of a van with three people in it and told carers that, 
Mommy was in the trunk. Investigators informed the media that they planned to question Joshua again and subpoenaed all footage and interviews of Joshua from local television stations. On December 14, Joshua retained an attorney in connection with the investigation, and police said that he grew increasingly uncooperative. A few days later, he took his sons to pile up to stay with Stephen for the holidays. By December 24, Joshua was considered a person of interest in the investigation. On January 6, 2010, he returned with his brother, Michael, to pack the family's belongings, indicating he was moving permanently to pile up. Developments in 2200 Wontwell. Disappearance of Susan Powell is located in USA West West Valley City, Utah West Valley City, Utah South Hill, Washington South Hill, Washington. The Powells lived in West Valley City, Utah. When Susan disappeared in 2009, Joshua Powell killed himself and their children Charles and Braddon Powell in South Hill, Washington in 2012. In pile-up, Joshua occupied a home with his two sons, his father Stephen, his brothers Michael and Jonathan, and his sister Elena. Joshua indicated that he would rent out his house in Utah. It was reported that he returned to pile-up after he had lost his job. Soon afterwards, the website SusanPowell.org was launched, described as the official website of Susan Powell. The site's anonymous entries defended Joshua as the victim of a smear campaign by Susan's family, his estranged sister Jennifer, and the LDS Church. Additional posts also speculated that Susan's disappearance was connected to that of Stephen Kocher, a former journalist who vanished the same week as Susan and that the two had run off to Brazil together. Joshua and Stephen were widely believed to have written these posts. In late 2010, both men claimed that Susan had abandoned her family due to mental illness and that she had left with another man. Susan's family rejected these claims as being unsupported by any evidence. Investigators' scrutiny extended to Stephen upon learning from a family friend that he had been obsessed with his son's wife. Computer images seized from his house in 2010 turned up 4,500 images of Susan taken without her knowledge, including close-ups of specific body parts. Police also turned their attention to Michael after learning that he had sold his broken-down Ford Taurus to a wrecking yard in Pendleton, Oregon, shortly after Susan's disappearance, and had later ordered satellite images of the lot when police found the car. A sniffer dog indicated that a decomposing human body had been in the trunk. DNA tests on the car proved inconclusive. On September 14, 2011, Utah authorities discovered a possible gravesite while searching Topaz Mountain, a desert area near Nephi that Joshua had frequented as a campsite. There were signs of recent soil disturbance and shoveling. But after digging a few feet down, police were unable to find any remains. In spite of careful sifting of the soil, federal anthropologists also ruled out the possibility of the site being an ancient burial ground. Police continued to examine the site for a time, but offered no explanation as to why they previously announced the finding of remains when none had actually been confirmed. Authorities said they were following a scent detected by their sniffer dogs. Relations between and within the Powell and Cox families became increasingly hostile. After a police raid in their home in 2011, both Joshua and Stephen spoke to major news outlets regarding journals that Susan had allegedly written about the relationship between Stephen and herself. Stephen claimed that he and Susan had been falling in love prior to her disappearance, and he cited the content of the journals as evidence to support his theory that she was mentally unstable and could have run away with another man. A judge issued a permanent injunction forbidding Joshua and Stephen from publishing any material from Susan's journals ordering the pair to either return or destroy any journals already published. On September 22, Stephen was arrested on charges of voyeurism and child pornography after police found evidence that he had secretly videotaped numerous women and young girls, including Susan. John Long, Assistant Attorney General for Washington State, said that Joshua was a subject in the child pornography investigation. A friend of Stephen claimed that he was preoccupied with pornography and was hung up on sexually. Chuck Cox filed for custody of Susan's children the day after Stephen was arrested. A Washington court eventually granted Cox temporary custody of the boys, 
ruling that Joshua would have to move out of Stephen's home if he wanted to regain custody. Joshua rented a house in South Hill. But authorities later alleged that he had never actually moved into that house, merely making it appear as if he had satisfied the court's instructions while continuing to reside at Stephen's home. In late September 2011, Joshua's sister Jennifer stated that she believed Joshua was responsible for his wife Susan Powell's disappearance. His other sister Elena had also been suspicious of him as well. However, she later withdrew her suspicions and felt that Joshua had been unduly harassed by the investigation. By this time, West Valley City had spent more than half a million dollars on the case. On September 28, Mayor Mike Winder indicated that he felt that the case was worth the expense, stating, We feel that we are getting to that tipping point where we have more hot evidence than we have had in the past two years, and that the case was moving forward. In late 2011, Joshua underwent a series of court-ordered evaluations in Washington. The evaluations by James Manley determined that Joshua had adequate parenting skills, a steady employment history and no criminal record or history of domestic violence. However, Manley also raised issues concerning the ongoing criminal investigations, Joshua's failure to admit normal personal shortcomings, his overbearing behavior with his sons, and his persistent defensiveness and paranoia. The initial recommendation was for Joshua to have visitation with his sons several times a week, supervised by a social worker. In the last week of January 2012, Utah police discovered about 400 images of simulated child pornography, bestiality, and incest on a computer seized from the Powell family home. The pornography had been cached when viewed by the previous owner of the computer which had been purchased by Susan secondhand. However, Utah authorities misled the court and accused Joshua of having viewed the images. The images, while not illegal due to their being in a hand-drawn or cartoonish 3D format, were cause for great concern to Manley, particularly given Joshua's earlier denial of possessing any such material. Joshua was recommended to receive a more thorough psychosexual evaluation and polygraph test. But Manley suggested no change in the visitation schedule with the Powell boys. Meanwhile, Michael established a Google Sites page which claimed that Susan's parents were abusing and neglecting the boys in collusion with child welfare authorities, and that West Valley City Police had both mishandled the investigation into Susan's disappearance and were harassing Joshua. Lawyers for the Cox family disputed the allegations, and Google removed the site after a few days due to terms of use violation. West Valley City, Utah, U.S. On February 5, 2012, social worker Elizabeth Griffin Hall called 911 after taking Charlie and Braddon to a supervised visit at Joshua's house in South Hill. Hall, who was supposed to monitor the visit between Joshua and the boys, reported that he grabbed them and would not let her through the door. Soon thereafter, the house exploded killing Joshua and the two children. Local authorities treated the case as a double murder-suicide, saying that the act appeared to have been deliberate. When authorities notified Stephen, who was in jail, he didn't seem very upset by the news, but was angry towards authorities who notified him. Two weeks later, Stephen invoked his Fifth Amendment right not to answer questions regarding Susan's disappearance. Cox and others have stated they believe that Stephen knew what actually happened to Susan. Stephen was convicted of voyeurism charges in May 2012 in a trial which largely skirted the issue of Susan's case. After a relatively brief investigation, officials confirmed that the explosion had been deliberately planned. The official cause of death for Joshua and the two boys was determined to be carbon monoxide poisoning though the coroner also noted that both children had significant chopping injuries on the head and neck. A hatchet was recovered near Joshua's body, and investigators believe that he attacked the boys with it before being overwhelmed by smoke and fumes. The fire investigation also found two five-gallon cans of gasoline on the premises, as well as evidence that gasoline had been spread throughout the house. Friends and relatives of Joshua told authorities that he had contacted them by email minutes before the incident to say goodbye. Some of them, including his local bishop, received instructions for finding his money and shutting off his utilities. Records also showed that Joshua had withdrawn $7,000 from his bank account and had donated his children's toys and books to local charities the day before the incident. 
Joshua named Michael as the main beneficiary of his life insurance policy. Charles and Braddon are buried at Woodbine Cemetery, which also contains a memorial for their mother. Joshua's remains were cremated on February 11, 2013, approximately one year after the death of Joshua and his sons. Michael killed himself in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he had moved for graduate school. He jumped from the roof of a parking garage. Police had questioned Michael several times in 2012 after discovering his abandoned Ford at the Oregon wrecking yard. Michael was evasive about why he left the car at that location. Utah authorities have since said they believe that Joshua and Michael were accomplices in the murder of Susan. In a February 2013 interview, Manley, who had conducted the two 11,200 want woe evaluations of Joshua for Washington authorities, acknowledged his suspicions that Joshua was involved in his wife's disappearance. However, he did not mention these suspicions in his report because they were beyond the scope of his duties and because Joshua had not been charged with any wrongdoing. On May 21, 2013, West Valley City Police announced that they had closed the active investigation into Susan's disappearance. Joshua's sister, Jennifer, wrote a memoir with co-author Emily Clausen about the Powell family's tumultuous history. The memoir was published in June 2013 as A Light in Dark Places. Jennifer was inspired to write the book. She says, to help other people to recognize abuse in either their own relationships or relationships around them because it's not always completely apparent. In March 2015, Chuck Cox won a protracted court battle with Terica and Elena Powell over control of Susan's estate. Terica and Elena had sought to have Susan declared legally dead to collect life insurance, but Cox ultimately gained full control of the estate. The Cox family also sued Washington's Department of Social and Health Services claiming that the agency prioritized Joshua's parental rights over the safety of the boys and facilitated their deaths. While a lower court initially ruled against the Coxes, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit reversed this ruling and allowed the case to proceed to trial in January 2019. Susan's family also pressured state lawmakers in Washington and Utah to pass bills that would restrict or block visitation rights for parents being investigated for murder. Stephen Powell was released from prison on July 11, 2017, after serving a total of seven years following his voyeurism and child pornography convictions. He died of natural causes in Tacoma, Washington, on July 23, 2018. In 2019, the Cold Podcast disclosed that the incestuous cartoon porn found by Utah police was not Joshua's nor even came from his computer. The pornographic pictures were found to be on a computer that actually belonged to Susan and that the pornography had been viewed by the computer's previous owners, from whom she had purchased the used computer secondhand. Cold declined to identify the original owners of the computer because no criminal charges have been filed against anyone related to the images. Susan remains a missing person, but given the fates of her sons, it is widely believed that she was murdered by her husband Joshua. There are calls as of March 2018 to have her declared dead, with the cause being homicide. In October 2018, the Crime Junkie podcast covered the case in one of its episodes titled Murdered. The Powell family, Dave Colley, a reporter for KSL News Radio in Salt Lake City, began a podcast on the Susan Powell case in November 2018. The podcast, titled Cold, offers evidence and information from the case that has never before been made public, such as voice and video recordings, interviews, and more. On February 10, 2021, a TV series development deal for the Cold podcast was announced. In December 2018, Investigation Discovery premiered an 85-minute documentary titled Susan Powell, and 499 Murder Mystery. A documentary titled The Disappearance of Susan Cox Powell premiered on Oxygen in May 2019. The two-night special was touted to be the definitive account of the investigation, revealing Stephen Powell's never-before-seen videos that were seized by police when he was arrested. The documentary included interviews with many who have never spoken out publicly, including Joshua Powell's sister Elena. In July 2019, the Morbid podcast discussed the case in its 82nd episode The Tragic Case of Susan Powell. Many Morbid, in December 2019, 
the podcast and that's why we drink discuss the case in their 152nd episode. Greg Olson and Rebecca Morris covered the story in their book If I, the story in their book If I, the story in their book If I, Heather Elvis, on December 17, 2013. Heather Elvis, of Carolina Forest, South Carolina, United States, went out for a first date with a man that ended when he dropped her off at her apartment the following morning at 1.15 a.m. at 1.44 a.m. Elvis called her roommate, Brianna Warlman, who was visiting her family, to tell her how the date had gone. The date had been Elvis' attempt to move on after a relationship with Sidney Murr, a repairman she had met through her job at a local restaurant. That had ended two months earlier. The girl's conversation lasted approximately ten minutes. Warlman had advised Elvis against returning Sidney's calls and cautioned Elvis not to do anything rash and to get some sleep. Elvis' cell phone activity ends that day around 6 a.m. and she has not been seen or heard from since that morning. According to some accounts, Elvis' disappearance had been a result of Moore's wife, Tammy, learning of her husband's affair. She sent Elvis several confrontational text messages, but denies any role in her disappearance. Phone records show that Elvis and Sidney's phones were used to call each other several times in the early hours of December 18th. He says the two did talk with each other briefly on two occasions, but also denies any wrongdoing. Despite security camera footage showing a truck believed to be his driving to and from the boat landing where Elvis's car was found that evening, four months later, both murderers were charged with murder, obstruction of justice, and indecent exposure. Investigation also led to the couple being charged with Medicaid fraud as well. The murder and indecent exposure charges were dropped in 2016. But Sidney was convicted of the obstruction charge the following year. Two men, one a relative of Elvis, were charged with obstructing justice in 2014 for posting misleading information online and conducting their own independent investigation. Sidney's 2017 trial on the charges ended in a hung jury and he has been awaiting a retrial. Shortly after the mistrial, the Moors were indicted on an additional charge of conspiracy. Tammy was convicted of both charges in October 2018. Despite the convictions, many of the facts of the case remain in dispute. In text messages and posts on social media, Tammy depicted Elvis as an obsessed stalker whose attention to her husband would not have bothered her if she had not become physically threatening to the family. Elvis' friends have suggested, in turn, that Sidney privately told Elvis he wanted to continue the affair to the point of leaving his wife, who reportedly handcuffed him to the bed at night to keep him faithful to her and, Sidney's family says, physically abused him. Sidney reported to the police several instances in which he was physically threatened while on bail from the murder charges, and posted signs decrying harassment of his children on his property. Similarly, the Elvises held a news conference to denounce what they claimed was organized online harassment of them. Heather Elvis, a native of Horry County, South Carolina, graduated in 2011 from St. James High School in Merle's Inlet. Her parents allowed her as their older daughter, to move out to her own apartment shortly afterwards in Carolina Forest, which she shared with a roommate from out of state. She worked as a hostess at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach and House of Blues in North Myrtle Beach while studying cosmetology. In June 2013, Elvis took notice of Sidney Moore, a 37-year-old married resident of Saucasty who repaired the kitchen equipment at the Tilted Kilt, she tweeted early that month that she had a taste for men who are older. Her roommate, Bry Warlman, also a co-worker at that time, recalled that Elvis pointed Moore out to her at work. Almost a month later, she expressed sexual interest in the guy who builds things at my job and expressed a desire to rape him. A July 12th tweet, responding to a friend who had told Elvis she had a lot of explaining to do, named a Sydney as someone she would go out of her way to see. Four hours afterwards, she followed up with Baby did a bad, bad thing and I'm in way too deep. But watch me get in deeper. Friends and co-workers recalled that Elvis also discussed the relationship she was having with them as well. Mora would often come to the restaurants when he was not working to deliver coffee and bagels to her. He considered asking Elvis to work as his children's nanny should he and his wife move to Florida as they were considering doing. Mora said his affair with Elvis was primarily confined to September 2013 late that month. Elvis tweeted that, 
Once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love. It did not end well, which has since been interpreted as referring to the relationship. By then ended, shortly afterwards, Mura's wife Tammy found out about the affair and became very angry. According to Warlman, Tammy made Sydney call Elvis and end the affair with her listening. Sydney, she says, told Elvis that she was nothing to me, just someone who spread your legs. Warlman said Sydney basically tore Heather apart as a human being and made her feel horrible about herself. Tammy, who later told a friend that her husband and Elvis had confined their relations to oral sex, also sent the younger woman texts and pictures of herself and Sydney in sexual situations to make sure Sydney remained faithful to her. Tammy handcuffed him to the couple's bed every night, he said later, changed his phone password to one only she knew, and accompanied him whenever he traveled outside the house. Sydney agreed to all these restrictions in order to save their marriage. Tammy also made Sydney get her name tattooed above his crotch. However, Tammy continued to contact Elvis, texting her, Hey sweetie, ready to meet the missus, threatening her physically, or implying that she was going to kill her husband. On November 1st, Elvis texted back that she was no one you need to worry about anymore. A text that said by the way, Dad no longer has his phone, presumably referring to Sydney, drew a period in response from Heather, her only other direct response to the many messages she received from Tammy. Tammy also tried to get Elvis fired from her job at the Tilted Kilt, calling the restaurant regularly and telling them her husband would stop repairing their equipment as long as Elvis continued working there. At one point, Sydney reportedly managed to begin texting Elvis again, telling her that his wife had not objected to the affair itself, since she also had a lover but to his lying about it. Elvis asked him when he would have his phone back, and he said the relationship was over. She agreed, but said she wanted Tammy to stop calling the tilted kilt. I lost hours today because they sent me home after she kept calling. She wrote at one point, on November 5th. When Elvis last saw Sydney, she retweeted a joke by comedian Daniel Tosh that seemed to be indirectly referencing the affair. Hey married fellas, you can either cheat on your wife or murder her. Never both. That's when you get caught. The couple, and their two children, left South Carolina to drive to Disneyland for a vacation on November 19. They returned on December 11. At the time of the Moore's return, Elvis, according to her friends and family, was moving on from the affair. She had gotten a job at a beauty parlor in downtown Myrtle Beach, starting just before Christmas, which she was eagerly anticipating and resolved, along with Warlman, to begin attending church regularly. However, Elvis had put on weight and co-workers at the Tilted Kilt noted that her uniforms had gone up three bra sizes. Elvis was concerned she had become pregnant, possibly by Sydney. Her manager at the Tilted Kilt said she had taken one pregnancy test, which came back as error. On the night of December 17th, Elvis went on a first date with another man, Stephen Scaraldi, starting at 10 p.m. He drove her around in his car looking at residential Christmas lights in the area. They later drove to the parking lot of the Inlet Square Mall, where he taught her how to drive his manual transmission vehicle. Elvis sent photos of herself using the stick to her father and Warlman. Scaraldi dropped Elvis off at her Carolina Forest apartment around 1.15 a.m. EST. He is the last person known to have seen her. Twenty minutes later, a call was placed from a payphone to Elvis's cell phone, lasting five minutes. Shortly afterwards, Elvis called Warlman, who was then out of state visiting her family for the holidays. Elvis said that Sidney had called, telling her he was planning to leave his wife, and asked her to meet him. Warlman, who described her roommate as hysterical during the conversation, counseled her not to do so. After two minutes, the call was ended. Elvis's whereabouts have not been conclusively established beyond 1.45 a.m. on December 18th. On the evening of December 19th, Elvis's green Dodge Intrepid was found, parked perpendicular to the spaces it was in, at the Peachtree Landing boat launch along the Waccamaw River in Saucasty, about eight miles from her apartment. The car was locked, and when opened, Elvis' phone, keys and purse were not inside. Calls to her phone went unanswered. 
and she was not at her apartment nor either of her jobs. Horry County Police began a missing person investigation. Scaraldi, the last person known to have seen Elvis, was quickly cleared. The day after the car was found, a search of the area around the boat landing found no sign of Elvis. Later searches of the riverbed down to Winnia Bay by a team of rescue divers from Coastal Carolina University were likewise fruitless. A set of bones discovered in another area nearby around New Year's Day were later found to belong to a male. Investigators were able to obtain Elvis's phone records, which showed considerable activity on the preceding morning over the two hours after she had told Warlman that Sydney had called her. Although they cannot say whether Elvis was the one using it, things showed that at 2.30 a.m., a call had been made from the phone to the payphone that had made the call Elvis said came from Sydney, but no one answered. Shortly afterwards, it was taken to Longbeard's Bar and Grill elsewhere in Carolina Forest, where it remained for 15 minutes after the phone left. It was taken as far away as Augusta Plantation Drive, whereupon it was returned to Longbeard's for another 15 minutes at the end of that time period. A call to Sydney's cell phone was placed from it, but was not answered. The phone appeared to be in motion, suggesting it had left Longbeard's. Within five minutes it was back at Elvis's apartment, and remained there for another five minutes. During that time it called Sydney's phone again, then located at his home, resulting in a four-minute conversation. At 3.37 a.m., about eight minutes after that call ended, the phone is taken to Peachtree Landing. A minute later, three attempts are made to call Sydney's phone within the space of two minutes. All are unanswered. At 3.41, another attempt was made. A minute and a half later, data records for Elvis' phone end. Its location could only be identified as somewhere in the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. Tammy and Sydney's phone records were also examined. There had been no communication between the two via those phones from November 2nd. The day Sidney would later testify he surrendered his phone to Tammy as a condition of remaining married, until 4.37 a.m. December 18th, when she sent him a text asking for the pot stickers and orange juice. Yes ma'am, he replied immediately afterwards. Police found video evidence further linking Sidney with Elvis's activities in the early hours of December 18th. Surveillance video from a Myrtle Beach Walmart showed that at 1.12 a.m. that night, Sydney entered the store, purchased cigars and a pregnancy test, and left after seven minutes. Footage from a kangaroo gas station on Joe White Avenue showed Sydney making the call from the payphone across the street to Elvis's cell phone at 1.35 a.m. Investigators also reviewed footage from private security cameras along the three miles between the Moorer's house and Peachtree Landing. Two, one at a home midway along the route and another closer to the landing showed a dark Ford F-150 passing in the direction of the landing at 3.36 and 3.39 a.m. respectively. At 3.45 and 3.46 a.m., the vehicle returns going the opposite direction. Its license plate is not visible. However, after analysis and enhancement of the video by both the South Carolina Highway Patrol's Accident Investigation Unit and the FBI, it was determined to be Sydney's and subsequently searched. The first two arrests related to the case were not the Murrers, or anyone else suspected of involvement in Elvis's disappearance. On January 28, 2014, William Christopher Barrett and Garrett Ryan Starnes were arrested and charged with obstruction of justice. Police said both men had posted information on social media about the case that was either false or misleading and that investigators had wasted time being diverted from the case when they looked into the posts. Both were released after posting bond. The charge against Starnes was dismissed in April when the charging officer missed the preliminary hearing because he mistakenly believed the case had been continued. Starnes was indicted on the charge in July, twice during February. Sidney told police that people had fired at him or brandished weapons while he was driving on local roads with his family due to publicity over his possible role in Elvis' disappearance. In the former incident, Georgetown County deputy sheriffs who responded saw no signs that his truck had been hit despite Sidney's claim that he had heard shells strike it. Sidney claimed later that in addition to those incidents, he had been followed and received threats against himself and his home and the family's pets had been killed and mutilated. Later, 
Sidney posted signs outside the family home lamenting the threats and the impact they had had on his children, whom some of them, he said, had been directed at by name. On February 21st, police closed off the section of South Carolina Highway 814 next to the Murrah residence to execute a search warrant for the property, after 11 hours in which law enforcement searched thoroughly. The Murrahs were both arrested at home and charged with murder, kidnapping, obstruction of justice and two counts each of indecent exposure. The latter charge resulted from sexually explicit images found on their phones that they were determined to have taken of themselves in public places. The obstruction charges against Sidney were later specified as resulting from his early denial of his use of the payphone, a claim he reportedly retracted only when confronted with the security camera footage from the gas station showing him making the call. At a news conference announcing the arrests, Police did not go into detail about what evidence supported the murder and kidnapping charges. The Moors posted the $20,000 bond set for the obstruction and exposure charges, but later waived the bond on the kidnapping charges in favor of the murder charges, on which they were initially held without bond. A month after the arrests, the court imposed a gag order on all participants in the case. Investigators also announced that they would later be making additional charges unrelated to the Elvis case that instead involved financial discrepancies filed with the state of South Carolina on behalf of the occupants of the resident. In June, these charges were formally filed as related to Medicaid fraud. Investigators said that on a 2007 application for benefits that exceeded $10,000 the Moorers had failed to disclose the income from their businesses. In the wake of the arrests, the Moorers drew heavy support on social media. Tammy and Sidney had disparaged Elvis as a stalker beforehand on various sites, particularly their Facebook pages, suggesting the police had framed them and were protecting the real killers. The Elvis family tried to fight back but felt overwhelmed. At one point they barred a local newspaper which had repeated, in its coverage, some of the allegations made against them. From a news conference they held discussing the online harassment, in early 2015, the Murrers were released from jail, where they had been held for the preceding 11 months. After a judge accepted Tammy's mother's house as collateral sufficient to guarantee the $100,000 bond on the murder charges, at the bond hearing, prosecutors told the court they still had no direct evidence linking the couple to Elvis's disappearance. The Elvis family argued against the release, claiming they had received threats from the Murrah family and their supporters. So the court required Sidney and Tammy to agree to GPS monitoring of their whereabouts, to stay five miles away from the Elvis family home at all times, and to avoid interacting with any of them on Facebook or other social media. Due to the continuing threats against Sidney and Tammy and their difficulties finding work in Horry County. In September, the court allowed the Murrs to move to Florida, where Sidney had found a job. While the case was still pending, they were required to continue to meet their bail conditions and waive extradition from Florida should they violate them. In March 2016, prosecutors dropped the murder charges against both Sidney and Tammy without prejudice meaning they could be reinstated later should the state decide to. The indecent exposure charges were dropped as well, along with the obstruction charge against Tammy. The charges related to the alleged Medicaid fraud remained. The Elvises said that while they were disappointed, they understood that prosecutors had to make decisions like that and hoped that further investigations and trials on the outstanding charges would eventually lead to them finding out what had happened to their daughter. There have been three trials so far related to the case. In June 2016, the first trial in relation to Elvis' disappearance took place when a jury was seated to decide whether Sidney had kidnapped her. Over the next four days, the state presented its case. Elvis's co-workers testified that she had had an affair with Sidney and that they, along with Elvis herself, believed she had gotten pregnant as a result. Law enforcement specialists documented the phone and video records that prosecutors argued connected Sydney to Elvis the morning she disappeared. The jurors were also taken to see both Peachtree Landing and the Murrah's house. The last day of the trial was taken up by Worrellman's testimony. She described the affair between Elvis and Sydney in greater detail and became upset recalling her last conversation with her roommate on cross-examination. The defense asked her about some times Elvis had had difficulties with her family and a reportedly abusive former boyfriend who Elvis had dated prior to meeting Sidney. After the judge rejected the defense motion for a directed verdict of not guilty, 
Sidney's attorney Kirk Treslow rested his case, making his closing argument to the jury that the case against his client was entirely circumstantial and had only proved that he and Elvis had had an affair, after deliberating for seven hours. The jury informed the judge that they were irreconcilably divided. Ten of them wanted to convict, but two did not, due to this hung jury. The judge declared a mistrial, as of December 2018. A new date for that trial has not been set. Sidney's motion for a change of venue was granted. So when he is retried it will be in neighboring Georgetown County, on the trial's second day. Sidney spoke to a media outlet about the case, after the trial. The judge found him in contempt of court for violating the gag order and sentenced him to five months in jail. He was released after two due to good behavior. Upon release he spoke again to the media, saying he felt the jury in the trial had not been impartial and that the whole case amounted to malicious prosecution. Court proceedings related to the case resumed over a year later. In late July 2017 a hearing was held to determine whether Tammy had violated the gag order and should be charged with contempt of court. Neither the circumstances that necessitated the hearing, nor its disposition, were made public. Sidney was tried on the obstruction charge, a rare instance of that charge actually reaching that stage in South Carolina. Shortly afterwards, the case again focused on the cell phone records and video from the morning Elvis disappeared. As the prosecution attempted to prove to the jury that Sidney's initial denial that he had made the payphone call to Elvis, only to admit to it when confronted by the video evidence, hindered the progress of the investigation. A cousin of Tammy's also testified that at some point after the disappearance Sidney had shown him something on his phone which indicated that he had known more about the case than he had told police at that point, but did not elaborate in court as to what Sidney had shown him. In a Dateline episode that aired in March 2021, Prosecutors revealed that Tammy's cousin was referring to a photograph of Heather in which she appeared to be clearly deceased, with blood on her shirt and scratches on her face. After three days, Sidney was convicted. The judge sentenced him to ten years in prison, the maximum for the offense. With credit for nearly a year of time served over a year earlier, Sidney will likely be paroled long before serving the full sentence. Although his first application, in November 2018, was unanimously denied. As of October 2018, he is being held at Lee Correctional Institution. Treslow said he would appeal. Since as the offense is largely a matter of common law in South Carolina rather than statutorily defined, he felt it was so vague and overbroad as to be unconstitutional when applied to his client in this case. I also believe it is obvious that much more of the trial had to do with the underlying allegations. He said, while Sidney had indeed lied to the police, he claimed it did not seriously hinder their investigation and accused prosecutors of just trying to put somebody away, just so can say put somebody away. In April 2018, a grand jury indicted Sidney and Tammy on a single count of conspiracy to kidnap. The first time in the case charges had been brought that way, prosecutors would not elaborate on the specifics of the charges, citing the standing gag order. But commentators believed the indictment, and especially the additional charge, suggested that either new evidence had been found or one of them had agreed to testify against the other. The only way you're going to get a conspiracy conviction is if the co-conspirator comes forward, said one, failing that. The goal might have been to put pressure on them both to do so, in October 2018. Almost five years after Elvis's disappearance, Tammy went on trial, drawing national media attention. In addition to the documentary evidence that had been introduced in Sidney's trial, the prosecution introduced the threatening text messages she had sent Elvis to support the state's theory that Tammy had been driven into a jealous rage when she knew of Elvis' possible pregnancy, giving her a motive to hurt her. Shortly after the disappearance, Tammy had called Elvis a psycho whore in a Facebook post and suggested that the younger woman had been stalking her and her children. Sidney's mother testified that a few days after learning of the affair, Tammy beat her husband severely. Sexually explicit texts Tammy had sent to her lover were also introduced, prompting the defense to move for a mistrial since they argued they were so prejudicial to her character that a jury could be moved to convict her from them despite what they considered to be minimal relevance to the charges she faced. But, her attorneys pointed out, 
In the same message she had also said the affair itself had not bothered her. Since she had herself taken a lover, rather it was Elvis stalking the family that upset her. In a police interview played for the jury, Tammy claimed to have had an open marriage when she herself took the stand later in the trial. She said she had actually had a nice conversation with Elvis the month before her disappearance and resolved any issues the two had. However, a detective who interviewed Tammy recalled that she had characterized Sidney's relationship with Elvis as inconsequential. She showed Tammy a hotel room key found in Elvis's car, as well as a receipt indicating Sidney had paid for the room, suggesting it had been somewhat more serious. Prosecutors brought this up on cross-examination, as well as eliciting from Tammy an admission that she and Sidney were now legally separated due to her disappointment over him not having taken the stand in his own defense during either of his trials. Tammy's lawyers responded that her only response to learning that Sidney's liaison with Elvis had included a hotel room stay was to take a photograph of the receipt with her phone. Tammy's defense had to change its presentation before presenting any witnesses after five of them. Her children, mother, and another who had not been identified, were accused of violating a sequestration order forbidding them from watching live coverage of the trial. A deputy sheriff testified in a hearing that he had seen them watching news coverage on a laptop while waiting to testify. Although the Moorer's son denied this, the judge ruled that they had and barred the defense from presenting them. After a recess, the defense thus began its case with Tammy's sister Ashley Kaysen, who disputed several aspects of the prosecution case. Kaysen testified that Sidney had gotten his tattoo in January 2012 long before he had met Elvis, and that she could prove this with texts between herself and the tattooist's wife. She also said that Tammy did not handcuff Sidney to the bed, only that they liked to use the cuffs for sexual role-playing, in which capacity she would sometimes handcuff him to the bed. On cross-examination, the prosecution confronted her with her police interview where she had said otherwise. The defense also elicited from Kaysen some testimony about the events of the night Elvis disappeared. While Kaysen had been watching the Moore children until 3 a.m., she said this was not an unusual occurrence since the children were homeschooled and often stayed up late. Tammy had texted her at 3.10 a.m. that she and Sidney were home, whereupon the children walked back there. Sidney Moffat, a former roommate of Elvis, testified about her abusive previous boyfriend and recounted an incident in 2012 where Elvis returned from work with bruises on her neck that she did not explain. However, she said on cross-examination that she had not had much contact with Elvis since that year. Two men who knew Elvis testified. One said that he had had a sexual relationship with her but offered no other details. And the other that he had possibly murder of Holly Bobo. Holly Lynn Bobo was an American woman who disappeared on April 13, 2011. From her family home in Darden, Tennessee, she was last seen alive by her brother Clint, shortly before 8 a.m., walking into the woods outside her home with a man wearing camouflage. In September 2014, Bobo's partial remains were found in northern Decatur County, and her death was ruled a homicide via a gunshot to the back of the head. Six men have been arrested for varying degrees of involvement in the murder. However, only three of the six have been prosecuted. Most of the arrests were made on the basis of a confession by a man with an intellectual disability named John Dylan Adams, who told police he saw his brother, Zach, and another friend, Jason Autry, with Bobo at his brother's home after her kidnapping. It is unknown what led police to question Dylan about Bobo's disappearance. Dylan, Zach, and Autry were charged with especially aggravated kidnapping first-degree murder and rape of the other three men arrested. Charges against two were dropped, and one committed suicide without any charges being filed against him. The case has been met with several setbacks such as the death of a suspect, multiple changes to the prosecutorial team, and disputes with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. The prosecution has been heavily criticized for its refusal to produce evidence against the defendants missing multiple discovery deadlines, and for making frequent changes to the charges against the defendants with little explanation. 
The TBI even briefly withdrew its services to the entire district after the prosecutor accused the agency of compromising the case by proceeding so slowly that the culprits were always one step ahead and that TBI was leaking information, possibly covering up evidence. Defense attorneys reported they still had yet to receive a bill of particulars detailing the case against their clients and the results of forensic testing done on evidence from the case over a year after the arrests were made, and filed motions to dismiss charges on the grounds of silence or stonewalling. The arrests took place in early 2014. But it was not until July 2015 that it was announced that the defendants finally received access to all the evidence against them. On September 22, 2017, a jury found Zach guilty on all charges, including first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 50 years on September 23. He maintains his innocence. In January 2018, Zach's brother, Dylan accepted an Alford plea and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Autry chose to make a plea bargain with prosecutors wherein he would testify against Zach in exchange for a significantly reduced sentence. On September 16, 2020, after accepting a deal that reduced his sentence to eight years of time served, Autry was released from Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Nashville. At the time of her disappearance, Holly Bobo was a 20-year-old nursing student at the University of Tennessee at Martin Parsons Center in Parsons, living with her parents and brother in Darden. Friends described her as shy and sweet. Holly was the cousin of country singer Whitney Duncan. In 2017, Duncan released a song called Better Place in Memory of Holly. On the morning of April 13, 2011, Bobo woke at 4.30 a.m. to study for an exam. At 7.30 a.m., she answered a call from her boyfriend, Drew Scott, who was turkey hunting nearby on her grandmother's property. Bobo's parents had left for work by this point and her brother Clint was still asleep. Twelve minutes later, Bobo made her last cell phone call. After this point, all phone calls and texts were incoming and unanswered. Shortly after Bobo's final phone call ended, a neighbor heard a scream from the Bobo residence. The neighbor called his mother to tell her about what he heard and the mother in turn called Bobo's mother Karen at work. Meanwhile, Clint was awakened by the family dogs barking and saw Holly outside with a man dressed in camouflage. It appeared to be Holly kneeling down and Drew. They looked like they were kneeled down, facing each other in the garage, and they were talking back and forth. Holly sounded very upset and heated. He was doing much of the talking, and she would answer back and things like that. I couldn't make out hardly any of the words. The only words I could make out from here were Holly saying, No, why? Clint said that he believed the couple were breaking up. At some point, Karen called home and spoke to Clint. I said, Clint, that's not Drew. Get a gun and shoot him. Clint reportedly replied, You want me to shoot Drew? Still believing the man was Holly's boyfriend, Karen called 911. But because she was calling from work she reached the dispatcher for the wrong county. At home. Clint looked outside again and saw the man walking with Holly into nearby woods. At this point, he noted that the man was larger than Scott. Clint tried to call his sister's cell phone as well as Scott's cell phone, but neither call was answered. When Karen called her house again, Clint told her what he witnessed and was instructed to call 911. Clint fetched a loaded pistol and went outside, where he found bloodstains belonging to Holly in the garage. He dialed 911. Police arrived at the Bobo residence 10 minutes later. Cell phone pings showed Holly Bobo's cell phone moving away from her home tower heading north. Her cell phone continued north to a wooded area near Interstate 40, where her remains were eventually found. After it stopped moving for 20, 30 minutes, the cell phone began traveling south again using a different route. The last cell phone ping came from Bobo's phone in the area where both the phone and its SIM card were later found. Clint described the man as being between 5 feet 10 inches and 6 feet tall, weighing 180,200 pounds and having dark hair sticking out from under his cap that was long enough to cover his neck and touch his collar. Clint said the man was wearing a hat and camouflage clothing from head to toe and identified the pattern as either mossy oak breakup or leafy wear. He described the male voice he heard as very deep and low. Extensive searches of the area were conducted following Bobo's disappearance. Several items belonging to Bobo were found scattered throughout the town, including her lunchbox, a receipt with her name on it, 
a card from school, her cell phone, and the SIM card, which had been removed from it. Early in the investigation, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation focused heavily on a registered sex offender who matched the witness description named Terry Britt. His home was wiretapped and searched during the course of the investigation, but he was never charged. In September 2014, Bobo's partial remains were found by ginseng hunters in a wooded area of northern Decatur County, Tennessee, just off I-40, nearly 20 miles from Darden. The owner of the property said it was not uncommon for people to hunt there without permission. One of the men who found the remains said he saw a large bucket in the woods, which he upturned. Details of the contents have not been released. He then spotted Bobo's remains spread on the ground behind him. Investigators recovered her skull, teeth, several ribs, and one shoulder blade. Her skull had a bullet hole in the back of it on the right with the trajectory going left fracturing her left cheekbone when it exited. A total of six men have been implicated in connection with Bobo's disappearance. With the first of the arrests occurring in March 2014, prior to the discovery of Holly's remains, Zach Adams, his brother Dylan Adams, and friend Jason Autry were ultimately charged with especially aggravated kidnapping, first-degree murder, and rape. Another two men, Jeffrey and Mark Piercy, were arrested on charges of accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence. However, charges against the Piercy brothers were dropped. Another man, Shane Austin, committed suicide. It is unclear what initially led law enforcement to suspect these men. But the investigation began with the arrest of Dylan Adams on unrelated weapons charges. Following this arrest, he told police that he witnessed Bobo alive with his brother at Zach's home following her abduction. An affidavit for a search warrant states that Dylan told authorities that on April 13, 2011, he went to Zach's residence to get his truck. Dylan reportedly observed Holly Lynn Bobo sitting in a green chair in the living room wearing a pink t-shirt, with Jason Wayne Autry standing just a few feet away. He also told police Zach was wearing camouflage shorts black cut-off sleeve t-shirt and a pair of green Crocs shoes. Dylan also said that Zach told him he had raped Bobo and videotaped it. The alleged videotape has not been found. Dylan later recanted the confession and alleged that he was coerced. But his confession led to the arrests of Zach Adams, Jason Autry, and Shane Austin. Many of the details contained in the confession were eventually found to be inconsistent with the known evidence and the narrative presented later in court was vastly different. In early 2017, it was announced that Jason Autry had agreed to testify against Zach in exchange for leniency. In 2014, District Attorney Matt Stowe said he and the TBI were still actively looking to bring criminal charges against additional people. Although he declined to name the parties or the charges, Shane Kyle Austin was initially offered immunity in exchange for information regarding the location of Bobo's body. Phone records indicate that Austin was in contact with Adams several times on the day of Bobo's abduction and police believed that Austin helped dispose of the body. The agreement was withdrawn after Austin was unable or unwilling to lead them to the body, and the district attorney released a statement saying that Austin has not been completely truthful, forthcoming, and cooperative as to any and all aspects of this investigation. In April, Austin's attorney filed a complaint against the state asking for an immediate and permanent injunction preventing the state from charging Austin. Austin was found deceased in February 2015 while in custody at the Henderson County Sheriff's Department located in Lexington. TN while being held on unrelated previous charges of theft and burglary, he had committed suicide. Austin's attorney blamed the suicide on the continual threats of prosecution as well as the witch hunt style of investigation where they relied on rumors instead of evidence. His attorney insists he had nothing to do with the murder and cooperated fully with police. In July 2014, Jeffrey Piercy and his brother Mark Piercy were arrested and charged with accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence. They were arrested on the basis of allegations made by Jeff's former roommate Sandra King, who alleged that in May 2014, Jeff showed her part of a video showing Adams assaulting Bobo who was tied up and crying. She told police that she watched only a small clip and did not see the sexual assault. Police arranged for King to make a recorded call to Jeff where she told him over the phone that video of Holly. If it had been you, I would have watched it, to which he replied, I know. 
King alleges that Piercy's brother Mark shot the video. Both brothers deny that a video existed and Jeff Piercy denies knowing the other men who have been arrested for the crime. Jeff claims that he was unable to hear Sandra during the phone conversation and that his ex-wife's name is also Holly. Police have analyzed over 20 phones but have not found any video. Charges against both men were subsequently dropped and the narrative described at Zach Adams' trial did not include any mention of involvement by the Piercy brothers. In September 2017, Zach Adams was the first to go on trial. The prosecution's case was largely circumstantial as there was no DNA or other forensic evidence tying him to the murder. Jason Autry, the state's key witness, testified to a series of events that was drastically different from those in Dylan Adams' confession. Autry testified that he was not involved in the abduction himself, but that he went to Austin's home to buy drugs, where he saw Austin and the Adams brothers disposing of evidence from the crime. Autry said that Zach Adams had a body in the back of his truck wrapped up in a multicolored blanket and that Austin was disposing of evidence in a burn barrel. Autry claimed that he agreed to help Zach Adams dispose of the body. They drove to a spot along the Tennessee River underneath the Interstate 40 bridge with plans to gut the body so that it would not float in the water. After unloading the body from the bed of the truck, they realized that Bobo was still alive, so Adams shot her in the back of the head, fearing that the noise of the gunshot might have attracted attention. Adams and Autry loaded the body back into the truck, and Adams dropped Autry off. Autry testified that Adams later said that he had dumped the body near a place called Kelly Ridge. The narrative presented at trial was that Austin and the Adams brothers went to the Bobo residence to teach Clint Bobo to make methamphetamine. An allegation that Bobo denies. Holly Bobo came out of the home screaming and hollering. And the men then abducted her. The prosecution alleged that Austin was the man whom Clint Bobo had described as walking into the woods with his sister. As he was the only one of the men who was close to the size of the man he had described. The three men were alleged to have raped Holly Bobo in a local bar known by the grandmother of both Austin and Autry. Two pieces of paper belonging to Holly Bobo. A receipt and a note card were found on the road where Austin lived. The receipt was found 75 feet from his driveway. The prosecution also presented other pieces of circumstantial evidence linking Zach Adams to the murder, including that he drove a white truck. A neighbor of the Bobo family had seen a white truck driving rapidly on the morning of the murder. A number of other witnesses testified that Adams made statements implicating himself in Bobo's disappearance. Adams' then-girlfriend Rebecca Earp testified that he said he would tie me up just like he did Holly Bobo and nobody would ever see me again. Zach Adams also allegedly threatened his brother after his arrest that he would put him in a hole beside her if he didn't keep his mouth shut. A gun, listed as an Arminius Model HW532 caliber Smith and Wesson Long revolver, was introduced into evidence by the prosecution. A local man, Victor Dinsmore, led police to the gun, claiming that Austin and Autry sold him the weapon in exchange for drugs. The gun was reportedly found underwater. Forensic tests on the weapon failed to find any DNA or fingerprints, and prosecutors were unable to link the gun to the case with ballistics tests. On September 22, 2017, a jury found Zach Adams guilty on all charges including first-degree murder, especially aggravated kidnapping and aggravated rape. On September 23, 2017, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole and two consecutive terms of 25 years for both the kidnapping and rape convictions. On January 18, 2018, John Dylan Adams pleaded guilty to charges of facilitation of first-degree murder and especially aggravated kidnapping. He was sentenced to 15 years for facilitation of first-degree murder and 35 years for especially aggravated kidnapping. Those sentences are set to run concurrently, meaning he will serve 35 years without parole. Dylan entered an Ford plea, a type of guilty plea in which the defendant does not admit to the criminal act and maintains his innocence, but concedes that the prosecution's case may result in a guilty verdict, despite confessions from Autry. Austin and Dylan Adams, all men arrested for the crime have vehemently denied involvement in the disappearance at some point and have accused the state of coercive tactics early in the case. Autry claimed that investigators tried to get him to testify falsely against Zach Adams. The family of Dylan Adams, who is mentally disabled, claimed that Hay kept him up all night 
would not give him anything to eat or drink and finally he said, what do you want me to say? According to family members, Dylan has some ability to read but cannot perform other tasks such as telling time. And they believe that Dylan is being manipulated. At the trial for Zach Adams, it was alleged that the state used unethical investigatory techniques to coerce a confession from his brother. In 2014, Dylan Adams was arrested on federal gun charges that would have ended in a lengthy prison sentence. The prosecutor, who was also handling the Bobo case, arranged a no-jail plea deal on the condition that he go live with a retired police officer, Dennis Benjamin, whom Dylan did not know. Five weeks later, Benjamin called 911 to report that he had someone in his home who wanted to confess to the murder of Holly Bobo, despite the fact that this confession led to the arrests. Much of what Adams confessed to did not match the evidence. Dylan Adams' mother claims that there was extensive coercion in his interrogation. In this statement Dylan is trying to tell his story as to what happened. And you've got this TBI agent saying, Don't you mean this? Don't you mean it happened like this? And, no. Dylan, it went down like this. And you can honestly tell it point that Dylan. I can as his mother, he gave up. He's like, okay. If that's what you said, okay. Jeffrey Piercy also claims the statements regarding his involvement were fabricated by King to assist her son, who is serving a long prison sentence. I have been upfront and honest about everything. I have willingly given them everything. Take it. I mean, it's there, he said. My heart goes out to the Bobo family. It could have very well been one of my kids, for someone to give them false hope, and that's exactly what's been done to them. He said, but for the justice system to just haul someone in and destroy their whole life. I mean, there's no sense in that at all. At Zach Adams' trial, his defense contended that he was 100% innocent. The defense alleged that Autry concocted a story in exchange for a reduced sentence. And that although some of his stories seemed to be corroborated, he had access to all of the details through discovery. The defense also pointed to the fact that cell phone pings did not follow the path that Holly Bobo's cell phone took and that none of the men matched the witness description given by Clint Bobo. The Adams brothers and Autry were all too tall and were either too slim or too heavy to be the abductor. Austin was the correct weight and height. But Bobo described a man with dark hair that covered his neck. Austin had short red hair. Former TBI agent Terry Dickews, who had been the lead investigator on the case, testified for the defense. He told the jury that he ruled the men out early in the case because Austin passed a polygraph. Their alibis checked out and cell phone records put Zach Adams and Holly Bobo several miles apart during the critical time frame. According to a defense expert, Adams and Bobo's cell phones were in separate sectors during nearly the entire time frame of the abduction. The cell phones came into the same sector only at about 9.10 a.m., over an hour later, Dickies also noted that for Autry's story to fit with the cell phone pings, the men would have had to drive 106 miles per hour, a scenario that is unlikely on the winding gravel roads they traveled. The defense also noted that all four men had been ruled out as the originator of a palm print found on Holly's car, while another suspect, Terry Britt, could not be excluded. Zach Adams' defense attorney, Jennifer Thompson, contended that the initial suspect in the case, Terry Britt, was the real killer, saying that he has never been cleared by the TBI and in fact it appears the government has more evidence of his guilt than it does of the three defendants charged in the present case. Britt is a convicted sex offender who has been convicted of multiple rapes. It was argued at trial that Britt fit the physical description and had a history of stalking blonde women. Clint Bobo also identified a voice sample of Britt's voice as being very similar to the voice he had heard that morning. Dick Hughes testified that Britt had fabricated an alibi. Britt told investigators that his wife stayed home from work that morning to help him install a bathtub. Through the investigation, Dick Hughes discovered that Britt's wife, Janet, had gone to work that morning. But Britt called and made her leave on the biggest news day of the county's history. The Brits did produce a handwritten receipt for the bathtub but the store had no record of the sale. According to Dick Hughes, Britt's wife had been with him on previous occasions when Britt had stalked girls. Britt could not be excluded as the contributor of the handprint. Dick Hughes also testified that following the Bobo abduction, 
Britt allegedly changed his appearance by cutting his hair. The U.S. Marshal Service Senior Inspector testified that at one point, Britt said, Sounds like you have it all figured out, and said he would plead to it, but did not clarify specific charges or conditions for a plea deal. The criminal case against the men charged has been met with strong criticism and conflict between members of the prosecution. Complicating the investigation, District Attorney Matt Stowe was elected to office in the summer of 2014 following the arrests and stated that he believes he was elected in part due to skepticism regarding the arrests and questions over whether enough evidence exists against them to obtain a conviction. Wanted another set of eyes on this Holly Bobo case. They weren't happy with everything that was coming out of there. And I think that they wanted someone else to take a look and someone else to say, we know what's going on. In the fall of 2014, Jason Autry's attorney, John Herbison, accused the prosecutor of arresting the defendants without probable cause as an unethical investigatory technique, then adding and dropping charges strategically before hearings to avoid having to produce evidence against the defendants. In October 2014, when evidence tampering charges were dropped against Dylan Adams just days after he was charged with rape, Herbison said, If those reports are correct, it means that they're just playing games, Herbison said. They charged him with something less serious in order to keep him locked up. And then when it comes time to answer questions about the charge, they dismiss that and charge him with a more serious charge in circuit court, where he's not entitled to a preliminary hearing. He also noted the state's similar treatment of Mark Piercy to avoid hearings. In August 2014, the state failed to arrange transport for Piercy to the courthouse causing the hearing to be rescheduled for September. But just prior to the new hearing the charges against him were dropped with the explanation given that Piercy was facing unrelated federal charges and they were being forced to wait to proceed with the state charges. Herbison said the laws regarding the charges would not preclude the state charges. If the state is claiming that is the case, the prosecutor is either ill-informed or being disingenuous. He said, charges were never reinstated in the case against his brother. Jeff was similarly dropped. Zach Adams' attorney, Jennifer Thompson, repeatedly said that evidence was not turned over to the defense. For example, in 2014, Dom Atsto made a statement that because Holly was menstruating at the time of her abduction, there was a lot of DNA evidence in Zachary Adams's Decatur County home. No DNA evidence was ever turned over to the defense or produced at trial. She also said that the medical examiner referred to materials that were never given to her. On December 17, 2014, nine months after Zach Adams' arrest, Judge Creed McGinley chastised prosecutors for delays in the case and for the state's failure to turn over evidence to the defense. I am absolutely out of patience with these cases not moving, he said. Judge McGinley ordered that a bill of particulars be filed for Zachary Adams's case within seven days and that discovery take place immediately. The prosecution ignored both deadlines. In response, attorneys for the men filed motions to dismiss charges. The motions filed accused the state of silence or stonewalling, stating that, among other things, the state had yet to disclose evidence that the skull found belonged to Bobo. It would appear to me if they had a skull with a dental match they would have given that to us right away. It's a little suspicious why we don't have that forensic information, said Autry's attorney Fletcher Long, following the hearing in December 2014. A dispute regarding the handling of the case led the TBI to briefly drop its investigation of the case and cut ties with the entire district, saying District Attorney Matt Stowe had accused them of misconduct. The TBI agreed to come back on the case after Stowe recused himself from the case and Jennifer Nichols was appointed as special prosecutor. Following Stowe's allegations of misconduct by the TBI, the defense attorneys working on the case stated that they intended to subpoena Stowe to question him regarding the alleged misconduct. Emails by Wally Kirby Executive Director of Tennessee District Attorney's Conference revealed that Stowe accused TBI of compromising the case by proceeding so slowly that the culprits were always one step ahead and that TBI dot 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 was leaking information and possibly covering up evidence. The case attracted a high level of national media coverage. Discovery Channel published an article several months after her disappearance, discussing how the high levels of media coverage including some instances of inaccurate media coverage, hurt the investigation. 
A notable example of misinformation was the description of her last known movements. Early reports inaccurately reported that Bobo was dragged into the woods. Flint later clarified that Holly had, in fact, walked with the man wearing camouflage into the woods, either willingly or by coercion. This clarification led to rumors that Clint had changed his story and was a suspect in his sister's disappearance. Whitney Duncan defended him in an April 17 Twitter statement, stating that he was innocent and not a suspect in the case. Some early sources also erroneously reported that the skull was found on property owned by Zach Adams's family. Her body was found 10 miles away from Adams's property on land owned by the Tubbs family. Police received scores of erroneous tips from the public including a number of psychics, making it difficult for police to identify important leads. On September 29, 2017, the ABC network aired an investigative journalism segment, Justice for Holly Bobo, on its primetime television program 20 Over 20, Kidnapping of Shannon Matthews. On the 19th of February 2008, Shannon Louise Matthews, a nine-year-old girl, was reported missing in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire, England. The search for her became a major missing person police operation which was compared to the disappearance of Madeline McCann. Shannon was found alive and well on the 14th of March 2008 at a Batley car house belonging to 39-year-old Michael Donovan. Donovan is the uncle of Craig Meehan, the boyfriend of the kidnapped girl's mother, Karen Matthews. The kidnapping was planned by Karen and Donovan to generate money from the publicity. Donovan, also known as Paul Drake, was to have eventually found Shannon, taken her to a police station and claimed the reward money, which would be split between Donovan and the child's mother. Donovan was charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment. Karen was charged with child neglect and perverting the course of justice on the 8th of April 2008. Their joint trial at Leeds Crown Court commenced on the 11th of November 2008 and concluded on the 4th of December with both defendants found guilty. They were both given eight-year prison sentences. Meehan was convicted of possessing child pornography which was discovered on his computer during the investigation, but had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Nine-year-old Shannon Matthews was seen at 1510 on the 19th of February 2008. Outside her school, Westmore Junior School, Dewsbury Moor. After a visit to the Dewsbury Sports Center swimming pool, the school was about half a mile from her home. At 1848, Karen Matthews rang the police to report her daughter missing after she had not returned home from school. West Yorkshire Police started the search which eventually involved more than 200 officers. The investigation into her disappearance was led by Detective Superintendent Andy Brennan. West Yorkshire Police questioned 1,500 motorists and searched 3,000 houses. By the 5th of March, more than 250 officers and 60 detectives were involved in the investigation, or about 10% of the West Yorkshire Force's operational strength. It became the largest police investigation in West Yorkshire since the Yorkshire Ripper case 30 years earlier. Of 27 specialist victim recovery dogs in the UK, 16 were involved in the search. The Sun newspaper offered a reward of £20,000 for information leading to Shannon's safe return. It was increased to £50,000 on the 10th of March, by which time she had been missing for 20 days. A business in Huddersfield, nine miles from Dewsbury, offered £5,000. West Yorkshire Police created a web page, Missing Shannon Matthews Appeal and on the 7th of March, released a photograph of Shannon on the website. The police released the recording of the 999 call made by Karen reporting the child's disappearance. An official website, Help Us Find Shannon, including the Shannon Matthews appeal, was launched on the 11th of March. Both websites were removed after Shannon was found. A comparison was drawn between publicity given to the disappearance of Madeline McCann and the much lower level of publicity for Shannon. Roy Greenslade, writing for the Guardian blog, explained, Overarching everything is social class but added that Shannon's disappearance in the UK made a difference. The Independent took the same line saying, Kate and Jerry McCann had a lot. They were a couple of nice middle-class doctors on holiday in an upmarket resort. Karen Matthews is not as elegant. Nor is eloquent. The Times noted that the local community had pulled together but that the hunt appeared less newsworthy than the most minor developments in the search for McCann.
The Brisbane Times said that Karen Matthews and Kate McCann represented two sides of the social class coin in Britain. The Daily Telegraph speculated that had Shannon been part of a middle-class family, in which articulate parents were conversant with the mechanics of mobilizing a slick public awareness campaign. Then more public attention would have been focused on the effort to find her. On the 7th of March, Karen said on ITV's GMTV that she was certain that her 22-year-old boyfriend Craig Meehan was not involved in the kidnapping and he would not hurt anybody. Meehan was defended by Shannon's father. Leon Rose, Karen and Meehan In an interview on BBC Radio 4's Today program on the 12th of March, were questioned about suggestions by her parents that Meehan had been violent towards Shannon and on Karen having seven children by at least five fathers. Commenting on the interview, the Independent said that the case had developed a cruel overtone and that such questions went far beyond necessity and lifted the lid on an uncomfortable hypocrisy in British society. West Yorkshire police found Shannon alive at 12.30 on the 14th of March 2008. 24 days after she went missing, she was concealed in the base of a divan bed in a flat in Lydgate Gardens. Batley Carr, Michael Donovan, the 39-year-old tenant of the flat, was arrested at the scene. Shannon was placed under police protection and cared for by the local social services department. The police exercised powers under Section 46 of the Children Act 1989 which allows a child to remain subject to police protection for 72 hours. She ceased to be subject to police protection on the 17th of March. Subsequently, she remained in the care of Kirkley's family services on a voluntary basis. On the 15th of March, the police reported that Shannon had begun to recover after her ordeal. Specially trained officers questioned her to establish what had happened. The questioning which lasted for several weeks, took place in 10-minute sessions at a special children's suite resembling a classroom. Donovan was charged with kidnapping, false imprisonment and committing acts intended to pervert the course of justice on the 17th of March 2008. He appeared before Dewsbury magistrates on the 18th of March and was remanded in custody. He appeared at Leeds Crown Court via a video link from his prison cell. On the 26th of March, the provisional trial date was fixed for the 11th of November. He made a suicide attempt on the 6th of April. Mian was arrested on the 2nd of April. On suspicion of possessing indecent images of children. After police had examined computers in the home, he was remanded in custody by Dewsbury magistrates. At a hearing on the 3rd of April charged with 11 offenses of possessing indecent images of children. On the 18th of April. Meehan pleaded not guilty and elected to be tried by magistrate rather than by jury. On the 16th of September 2008, he was convicted by Dewsbury magistrates of 11 counts of possessing child pornography relating to 49 images of level 1, 2, 3 and 4 found on his computer after it was seized from the house he lived in with Karen on Moorside Road on the same day. He was sentenced to 20 weeks imprisonment but was released as he had spent longer on remand than the length of the sentence. Karen was arrested on the 6th of April on suspicion of attempting to pervert the course of justice. She was charged with child neglect and perverting the course of justice on the 8th of April. At a hearing on the 5th of September 2008, she was also charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment. Amanda Hyatt Mian's sister was arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender on the 4th of April 2008. Mian's mother Alice Mian, sister of Michael Donovan, was arrested on suspicion of attempting to pervert the course of justice. On the 4th of April, Hyatt and Alice Mian were released on police bail on the 4th of April but were rearrested with Mian's sister Caroline on the 10th of April and held on suspicion of perverting the course of justice before being released on bail. Hyatt and Alice Meehan were later released without charge, although Hyatt was jailed the following year in an unrelated conviction for benefit fraud. On the 8th of April, the police announced they were investigating approaches to the Madeleines Fund for money to assist the search for Shannon. Karen Matthews was remanded to face trial alongside Donovan in November 2008. Matthews and Donovan were tried at Leeds Crown Court in November 2008. 
The trial heard evidence that Shannon had been drugged to subdue her whilst held. The Daily Telegraph reported that the jury was told Shannon was drugged and restrained with a strap tied to a roof beam after her mother hatched a plan to make 50,000 pounds from her fake kidnap. On the 13th of November, Detective Constable Mark Crudace and Detective Superintendent Andy Brennan gave evidence at Leeds Crown Court. A forensic toxicologist told the court that tests on Shannon's hair indicated she had been given temazepam for up to 20 months before her disappearance. Donovan claimed that Karen Matthews had asked him to look after her daughter for several days and that they would make money from newspaper rewards. He told the court that she had threatened him with violence. On the 27th of November, Karen Matthews gave evidence, sobbing throughout. She denied having anything to do with her daughter's disappearance, claiming that Mian told her to take the blame for what had happened. She said she did so because she was scared of him. In cross-examination, Julian Goose QC said that she had told police a total of five versions of the story and accused her of telling lie after lie. After lie, on the 4th of December 2008, Karen Matthews and Michael Donovan were found guilty of kidnapping, false imprisonment and perverting the course of justice. The plan had been for Donovan to release Shannon at Dewsbury Market, drive around the corner to discover her then take her to a police station and claim the £50,000 reward. This would be split between Donovan and Karen Matthews. On the 23rd of January 2009, both were sentenced to eight years in prison by Mr. Justice McCommon. Karen Matthews was released in April 2012 after serving half her sentence. Donovan had already been released. She reportedly moved to the south of the country where she is believed to be volunteering in a Christian charity shop, having turned to Christianity. But after having been photographed by the press while in her probation house, she has since changed her identity completely. During the trial, the prosecution revealed that Shannon Matthews had been suffering from nightmares after the event and needed regular psychotherapy counseling. Shannon was later given a new identity and placed with a foster family. In the aftermath of the trial, revelations about the life that Shannon Matthews and her siblings had endured with their mother were widely highlighted and politicized by the media. The welfare state was heavily scrutinized. The Daily Telegraph described a dysfunctional family where children equaled benefits. A claim that was supported by Shannon's aunt, Julie Poskett, writer and political activist Owen Jones later proposed in his 2011 book Chaps, the demonization of the working class that for both the conservative party and those parts of the media traditionally supportive of its agenda Karen Matthews had become a convenient political prop, that the case was cynically used to garner public support for the party's subsequent program of austerity, and cutbacks to spending on welfare. On the 16th of June 2010, a Kirkley's Safeguarding Children Board report found that social services could not have anticipated the abduction. It stated, The serious case review concluded that the historical and current knowledge available to professionals involved with this family could not have led them to anticipate the third child's abduction from her home or her mother's involvement in this. The only way to have avoided her abduction was through her prior removal from home under a care order and there is no evidence to suggest that this was warranted on the basis of professional knowledge about this case. A film of the search for Shannon and her homecoming was shown in an episode of the Channel 4 documentary series Cutting Edge on the 20th of March 2008, a BBC One panorama special. Shannon, the mother of all lies was broadcast on the night of the trial verdict about the disappearance and investigation, featuring the testimony of friends of the family and the police. The special was watched by 5.6 million viewers. On the 18th of May 2009, an ITV program, Tears, Lies and Videotape, documented cases of people who manipulated the media for personal attention. The Shannon Matthews case was the main focus of the show. The Moorside, a two-part dramatization of the case, aired on 7 and the 14th of February 2017 on BBC One. The drama focuses on the publicity campaign preceding Shannon's discovery and her mother's involvement in the scheme. Episode 1 was watched by 9.93 million viewers with the second watched by 10.23 million viewers. On the 28th of February 2017, Channel 5 broadcast a documentary entitled Shannon Matthews. What happened next that followed the key people in the investigation nine years later? On the 11th of February 2021, 
Channel 5 broadcast another documentary entitled The Disappearance of Shannon Matthews. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe and comment any feedback or story suggestions below.